Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. In this lecture, we will deal with a condition which is common to both medicine as well as surgery that is nephrolithiasis or renal calculi. So this is a condition in which patients present both in OPD as well as emergency. You can download the PDF of this lecture from MediLectures app, link is in the description. You can also check out our Harrison based revision videos which are priced as 1 triple line only for revising core units of Harrison in 35 hours of video content. So let's start our lecture with a case presentation. So a 28 year old male presents with sudden onset severe left sided flank pain. Pain is radiating to groin. Patient is restless and uncomfortable. There is nausea but no vomiting. There is no history of fever or hematuria. Past similar episode 1 years ago and on examination BP is 130 by 80, heart rate is 100 per minute and patient is afebrile. So let's see how can we approach this case logically using history examination and some investigations. So what basically is nephrolithiasis? It is formation of stones in renal collecting system. These stones are made up of crystalline substances like calcium, uric acid, struvite and cysteine. When we consider the most common stone type, it is calcium oxalate which is 75% of all the stones followed by calcium phosphate which is 15%, then uric acid 8%, least common are struvite and cysteine stones. Now, citrate in urine normally prevents calcium crystallization and stone formation and stones are common cause of acute flank pain. Now before we discuss the symptoms and diagnosis, let's first understand what these stones are made up of and why they actually form. So risk factors of renal calculi are divided into dietary risk factors, non-dietary risk factors, urinary risk factors and some other risk factors. So let's first discuss dietary risk factors in detail. Now there is increased risk of nephrolithiasis in patients who have diet rich in oxalate, sodium, sucrose, animal protein and vitamin C. So high oxalate is found in potato, legumes and dry fruits. What sodium and sucrose does is it increases urinary calcium excretion. It will increase urinary calcium therefore predisposing the patient to calcium oxalate and phosphate stones. What increased animal protein intake does is it increases urinary calcium as well as uric acid at the same time it decreases urinary citrate which prevents crystallization and stone formation. Similarly vitamin C excessive intake can also increase oxalate levels and lead to oxalate stones. Now decreased risk is associated with diet rich in calcium, potassium and phytates. Now all of you might be wondering how calcium rich diet can prevent stone formation. So increased calcium in diet basically binds to oxalate. It binds to oxalate and prevents the oxalate absorption from GI tract therefore decreases the risk of calcium oxalate stone. Potassium and phytates in the diet, what they do is they decrease urinary calcium excretion. They will decrease the urinary calcium. Coming on to fluids and beverages. So increased risk of renal calculus is with sugar sweetened beverages and decreased risk is with tea, coffee, beer, wine due to their diuretic effect. Coming on to urinary risk factors. So decrease in urinary volume less than 1 liter per day is, in, is associated with 2 times increased renal stone risk. Then increased urinary calcium will lead to calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate stones. Urine oxalate increase will lead to calcium oxalate stones. Decrease in urine citrate will also lead to calcium stones as it avoids the crystallization of calcium. Urine uric acid increase will lead to uric acid stones and let's see what is the association with urine pH. So uric acid stones usually formed in acidic pH less than 5.5, calcium phosphate more than 6.5, 
Cysteine stones are also formed in acidic urine and calcium oxalate stones which are most common type of stones are independent of pH. Now there are some genetic conditions which predispose to stone. So these include primary hyperoxaluria which is an autosomal recessive condition associated with increased endogenous oxalate generation from liver and then there is cystinuria. It is also autosomal recessive associated with staghorn calculus and multiple bilateral calculus. So in cystinuria, there is abnormal reabsorption of filtered basic amino acids in the nephron and there is increased cysteine excretion in urine. So now we know who all are at risk of developing renal stones. Let's move on to the patient presentation. So the two common presentations are pain and hematuria. Pain is sudden onset, severe, colicky and have flanked to groin radiation. So the stone if lodged in ureter will lead to unilateral flank pain which can also radiate. If the stone is in the upper ureter, there will be anterior radiation. If the stone is in lower ureter, it will radiate to ipsilateral labium in females and scrotum in males. Also this pain can mimic other diagnosis. For example, right sided pain can be confused with acute cholecystitis and appendicitis and stone at ureterovesical junction, junction between ureters and bladder can produce symptoms like urinary frequency and urgency. Then we have hematuria which can be gross or microscopic. Nausea, vomiting is significant in majority of the patient. Patient is typically restless unlike peritonitis patient where patient will lie still and a few patients may have signs of UTI or hydronephrosis in complicated cases. Now let's discuss some investigations. So investigation of choice for confirming a renal calculi is CT KUB. A non-contrast CT can be done but urine analysis will also help which can be suggestive of RBCs due to microscopic hematuria, then WBCs can be present if the uh, stone is secondary to infection, then we can see some crystals in urine examination and comment on possible stone formation in future and pH of urine also helps. Then serum test which should be done include serum creatinine, calcium and uric acid. Non-contrast CTKUB is the gold standard investigation but it cannot be done in pregnant patient. So for these, we go for USG KUB. X-ray can detect radio opaque stones like calcium oxalate and phosphate. Now, if the stone has already passed, we can also do stone analysis for prevention on further stone formation. Now, crystalluria can also help us identify the type of stone. So if we see envelope shaped crystals, it is suggestive of calcium oxalate. If we see hexagonal crystals, it is suggestive of cysteine stones. So basic types of stone include calcium oxalate which are most common followed by calcium phosphate. These are radio opaque stones. Uric acid stones are radiolucent. These are formed in acetic urine, especially in gout. Strovite stones are secondary to urinary tract infection. These are usually staghorn large calculus in renal pelvis formed in alkaline urine. And cysteine stones are very rare. These are due to genetic condition, cystinosis, and the crystals are hexagonal. Now let's discuss the management of the patient in general, followed by management of specific stone types. So for pain relief, we can give NSAIDs like diclofenac. Then we can give smooth muscle relaxants like dicyclomine and opioids if the pain is very severe. We have to encourage sufficient hydration if the patient is not vomiting, alpha blockers can help in expelling stones which are less than 10 millimeters. Then definitive removal by a surgeon can be required if the stone size is especially more than 10 millimeter. So this stone can be removed via ureteroscopy, extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy and percutaneous nephrolithotomy depending on size and location. If the infection is present, we have to treat the underlying infection. So if we have identified the stone type, the management and prevention of further stone formation includes for calcium oxalate stone, we ask the patient 
to take diet which is having less sodium animal protein he have to avoid high dose of vitamin c patient should take enough of citrate with alkali fruits and vegetables and we can also give thiazide diuretics which decreases the calcium excretion in urine similarly for calcium phosphate diet low in sodium and phosphate thiazides will help and alkali like potassium citrate can be given now since uric acid and cysteine stones specially develop in acidic ph so we give the patient urine alkalizer like potassium citrate then for uric acid we have to decrease uric acid by decreasing the animal protein intake also we can use some drugs like allopurinol or febuxostat for cysteine we have two specific drugs tyoprolin and penicillamine stroboid stone develop in presence of infection especially by urea producing bacteria like klebsiella so we have to treat the uti specific urea inhibitor includes acetohydroxamic acid and sometimes patient require surgery after we have discussed management one of the most important part is prevention so prevention is the best treatment especially for the patient with recurrent stones so we have to ask the patient for enough hydration aim for more than 2.5 liters urine per day we have to ask the patient for specific dietary modifications like to reduce sodium and animal protein maintain normal calcium intake there is no role of decreasing the calcium intake in diet medications are required if the patient is having recurrent stones like thiazides for hypercalciuria allopurinol for uric acid and potassium citrate for hypocitraturia so we have discussed in detail regarding renal stone now let's put it all together in form of a flow chart and see how to approach a patient so when the patient comes with a sudden flank pain we have to confirm the renal calculi with imaging the gold standard is ctkub at the same time we will relieve the pain of the patient assess the stone size we can allow trial of passage of stone or medical expulsion if the size is less than 10 mm if size of stone is big or anatomy is not favorable for expulsion of stone surgical intervention is required so evaluate stone type and correct metabolic causes for further prevention of stone formation so with this we have completed the lecture on nephrolithiasis at the end we have a mcq for all of you you can comment your answer in the comment section Thank you so much.